All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to be making an English IPA. Uh, so if you've ever wondered what IPA used to be like before the 21st century or what it evolved out of, stay tuned for more. The history of IPA in India Pale Ale, uh, which is worth defining in this context, is uh, a very long and somewhat uh, muddled thing. So very frequently, even in big name breweries, you hear the story that IPA evolved out of a British beer that was heavily hopped so that it would survive the voyage to India to be served to British soldiers at that time. Well, that's not entirely true. I don't know who that guy was, because he was clearly full of misinformation and had no idea what he was actually talking about, which goes to show that the history of IPA is indeed muddled. Uh, upon checking my sources during editing, I figured out that I'd actually not completely woken up when I did my research and spouted out totally wrong information. Something along the lines of IPAs evolved out of Burton Ales, which is totally not true. Uh, Burton Ales are a totally different thing, which were being brewed at the same time, but they're closer to an English Old Ale or a Barley Wine. Uh, very, very strong, sweet beers that were indeed heavily hopped, but they were not the precursor to IPA. Um, and I can't really remember where I found the article that said that that was the thing. Um, but it's not true. After doing a lot more research, and I will link some sources in the description, I found there is a consensus in terms of what became the IPA. At the time of the brewing of that beer, there was no British occupying army in India. Uh, there was, however, the East India Trading Company, which was made up of civilians, uh, British citizens, who would routinely get shipped beer for the British Isles. And the beer that they were most commonly getting was known as Porter. Not IPA. Uh, there's a common myth out there that says one of the reasons why the IPA was a pale ale is because the porters weren't making the journey successfully and they were spoiling. That's complete BS. It still remained a very popular beer in India. Now, when the East India Company was in its heyday in the middle of the 1700s, a new brewery popped up by the name of Hodgson's Bow Brewery, and it was like basically right on the docks, uh, where the East India Trading Company ships would come in and offload their cargo, get new cargo, keep going, etc. So basically Hodgson, the, the guy in charge of the brewery, hooked up this deal with the ships where he would give them large quantities of his new pale ale. And he was using a new kind of malting process which resulted in pale malts instead of dark malts as were used in the porters at the time. So he made this new pale ale. And he wanted to get his name out there and he wanted to get some customers. And he would basically give casks of these uh, on a very generous credit line to the ships. And as a result, these ales basically made their way all the way to India over a six to eight month uh, journey by ship. Being a pale and relatively low ABV beer, actually, uh, by the time they made it to India, they were actually quite popular. Uh, it's a hot climate there. It's much easier to drink a lighter, paler, drier tasting beer than it is to drink a thick, heavy port. Now, this, this is where the confusion with Burton Ale starts to come in. At the same time, the breweries of Burton, which had basically exporting contracts with uh, the, I believe it was Russia and a couple other European courts, uh, they lost those contracts. And at that point in time, they needed more business, so they hooked up a rail line to London and were able to set up um, a deals where they could export their beer to India as well. And that's where the confusion comes in of the IPA basically being a Burton Ale, a heavily hopped, high ABV beer. Um, now, those were also popular in India. I think they just liked beer, and they got beer shipped to them, and that's a pretty cool deal if you're stuck in, you know, halfway across the world in the middle of the 18th century. I'd be pretty happy too. But basically, at that time, British citizens that would either return to the British Isles or would go back and forth on the ships uh, really ended up developing an affinity for the pale ale, and they really wanted more brewers uh, in that area to start making beers like that. So, uh, as a result, many brewers started brewing pale ales as brewed for export to India. Um, which eventually evolved into what we would understand as the precursor to the IPA. Anyway, I hope you do enjoy the rest of this video. The beer turned out pretty well, and pretty much everything else I have to say is not complete crap. So, enjoy! What we're doing today is kind of the modern version of a British IPA. It's going to be a classic British ale uh, with its kind of toasty and biscuity character, hopped heavily with British hops to about 60 IBUs and aiming for a target gravity of about 1060. Uh, so not a super strong beer, not a super hoppy beer, but still a very enjoyable one that blends hops and the unique character of English hops in particular with uh, the nice malty toasty characteristics of English pale ale. 
Once again, I am brewing this on my claw hammer system and I'm using distilled water for the water profile. So you should be able to copy this recipe exactly. Uh, if you have one of those systems or a similar system like a grandfather robo brew or mash and boil, uh, all of those should be very similar to what this is. Uh, so this is our recipe. We are going to be using 10 pounds of Maris Otter. Any other type of English pale ale base malt is fine. You can use Golden Promise. Um, or just regular English pale ale malt, they should be fine. To that, we're adding one pound of victory malt and half a pound of crystal 40, which is your medium crystal, as well as crystal 120. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have access to the British crystal malts if, at my homebrew shop. They just have the generic crystal 40, 60, 80, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, if you can get access to British crystal malts, it's going to change how this beer tastes uh, much for the better. Uh, oftentimes, brewers are discouraged from using crystal malts for good reason. Um, they are not always the best choice for adding additional flavor and complexity, but they are traditional in British brewing. And I know what I said is probably gonna get a big old dislike from Peter at Genus Brewing, but hey, Logan agrees with me. To that, we're adding another traditional ingredient, which is just a handful, maybe like 0.1 ounces of black malt. Uh, which is actually just going to add a little bit of color and just a very, very interesting background note that is not quite going to be roasty. Uh, we don't really want roastiness in this. I did this with a Scotch Ale um, that I had just brewed and it turned out like just, it's awesome what that can do. I highly recommend doing this if you want to add just a touch of complexity and darkening uh, to your amber beers. Um, and I'll do this with a red IPA, I'll do this with an amber ale, and I'll do this with uh, this British IPA or any other amber British beer all day long. You can use either black malt, you can use Carafa 3 as well. Uh, but it has a really awesome effect and it's definitely worth trying. Uh, so for hops, we're gonna be adding uh, about 60 IBUs worth of hops, like I said. Uh, at 60 minutes, we're gonna add 1.2 ounces of target, and my target is 12.5%. Uh, um, at 10 minutes, we're gonna add 1.5 ounces of Fuggles at 4.4%. And at zero minutes, we're gonna add another one and a half ounces of Fuggles. Uh, once this beer has completed its primary fermentation, we're gonna go ahead and dry hop this with two ounces of Fuggles for about five days. And after that, we should be good to keg. For yeast, I'm gonna be using um, a little bit of an off script English yeast. Uh, normally you'd use uh, Yeast 1318 London Ale 3 for this style. Um, I'm gonna use Yeast 1968, which is the London ESB. Um, and that's gonna kind of push forward some of the more malty characteristics of this beer because, yeah, you know, let's be honest, 60 IBUs is at the upper echelon of what is you know, considered uh, within the guidelines for an English IPA. And it has a roughly one-to-one -one bitterness to gravity point ratio, which is actually kind of high for an English IPA. So if I push that maltiness a little bit more and I push out a little tiny bit of diastole it could actually have a really cool uh, rounding effect on the beer and I'm thinking that 1968 is going to do that but we got to make sure the yeast doesn't fall asleep because it kind of is notorious for doing that. Uh, finally for water like I said I'm starting with a distilled water base. Uh, I have eight gallons of distilled water in my claw hammer system right now that is heating up. To that I have added 10 grams of gypsum, 1 gram of sodium chloride, 5 grams of epsom, and 5 grams of calcium chloride, as well as 4 grams of baking soda. Uh, and that's going to get me a water profile that is very minerally, but that's on purpose. We're going to get 121 parts per million of calcium, 16 parts per million of magnesium, 49 parts per million of sodium, 248 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride and 95 parts per million of bicarbonate and that is going to get us a rather dry finishing uh, bitter biased beer uh, but with that multi character and the significant contribution of all of these different malts and a high probably a high-ish finishing gravity that is not a bad thing to have it biased towards that sulfate level uh, that is going to help keep the beer balanced and drinkable we are mashing this at 152 Fahrenheit for 90 minutes or until conversion is completed. Basically because we just want to keep this with a medium body, uh, all around standard mash temp, nothing special going on here. So anyway, everything is up to temp. So let's go ahead and mash in. All right, so the grain's been added, and uh, now we're gonna sit here at 152 degrees for probably about 90 minutes. Uh, but first, I'm gonna let everything kind of settle and recirculate through, uh, and then we'll check our pH, make sure we are in a good region, 5.2, 5.4 is ideal uh, for this, and uh, hopefully that's the case. 
If not, we'll go ahead and make some necessary adjustments as needed with either baking soda if it's too acidic or lactic acid if it's too basic. So we ended up getting a slightly lower pH than our target, uh, 5.1 versus 5.2. Uh, it's really not a big deal. When it comes to the mash, a 5.1 pH is absolutely fine, and if the beer ends up being too acidic, keep in mind that because we have a dry hopping condition in there, we're actually going to end up raising the pH just slightly. Uh, that is actually an effect that you can have from a dry hopping condition. If you end up with a beer that is acidic tasting, try throwing some dry hops on there, and uh, you'll actually change the pH a little bit. All right, so we're about 90 minutes into the mash now. Uh, conversion is completed. I'm gonna go ahead and start raising this up to the mash out temperature of 168 degrees. So once we reach the mash out step of 168, uh, we're gonna probably hold it there for about 15 minutes before we start to uh, drain the grain basket and get on with our brew day. So a uh, mash out is complete. We've been sitting at 168 for a while, so that should help us uh, have a much easier time letting the grain basket drain. Uh, so that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna stop the pump pull the uh, grain basket out and let it drain. All right, so while that's draining, uh, we're gonna go ahead and fire up the PID to 100% power and try to get a jump start on the boil. Okay, so this is the pre-boil gravity reading. It's about 13 bricks, which is about 1051 for a uh, gravity reading. And uh, that's actually pretty good. It's only two points lower than our target predicted uh, pre-boil gravity of 1053. So we have started our boil now, uh, and yeah, it's rolling along pretty nicely. Time to add our 60-minute bittering addition of hops, which is the 1.2 ounces of target. Let's go into the hop spider. And uh, well, yeah, we just let that go for another 50 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes from the end, we'll come back and add more things. As you can see here, I have the lid cracked on this because uh, it's pretty cold out. Um, I haven't yet received the insulation kit for it, so we're still kind of going without that. Um, but one way to keep heat in and still let volatiles escape is to just leave the lid cracked, uh, which is enough uh, that does let everything evaporate off quite nicely. All right, so it's now 10 minutes from the end of the boil. And, uh, I'm actually currently watching the Army-Navy football game. We're in the middle of the first quarter, so I'm gonna try and make this quick. Uh, so right now we're gonna be adding our 10 minute uh, hop addition, which is the uh, one and a half ounces of Fuggles. So those go in now. A couple other things we're gonna add include, there we go, World Flock tablet, as well as some yeast nutrient in order to encourage a healthy fermentation. And then, of course, the other thing we're going to do around this time is make sure that we sanitize the inside of a chiller. Uh, whatever chiller we're using, uh, whatever part of the chiller the wort is touching needs to be sanitized. And the best way to do that is to uh, run it through boiling wort, uh, as that will kill everything that's inside of it or on the outside of it's an immersion chiller. Um, so we're hooking that up now and going to recirculate through that chilling system for a while, um, the last 10 minutes of the boil or so. And uh, then after that, we'll come back for a zero minute hop addition and take it inside. And we're about to knock out, which is good because we just ran out of daylight. So here is the last hop edition. This is the zero minute hop edition of another ounce and a half of Fuggles. I'll put those in now. And uh, make sure they're getting in there. All right, now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna pause everything take it inside to where my cold water is and begin the chilling process. Okay, so here is our uh, OG. It's about 14 bricks, which is about 1056. Bit short uh, in terms of what we predicted. Uh, that's all right. So should make for a decent beer nonetheless. So the brew day went very well overall. I ended up getting pretty decent numbers, pretty accurate, but a little low. Again, on the OG might be due to having a full eight gallons instead of the normal seven and a half. Um, but this time I did get enough liquid into the fermenter instead of being slightly under five gallons like I was for the other two uh, batches that I've done on this system. So that's definitely good to see. Moving on to the uh, fermentation here, we're gonna be aiming for a somewhat cool fermentation. Uh, first of all, we wanna make sure we get plenty of oxygen into the fermenter. And the best way I've found for that to actually work without an actual aeration stone is to just splash it into the fermenter and create lots and lots of bubbles in there generates a lot of dissolved oxygen that the yeast will use to reproduce and be healthy in the first couple uh, days of fermentation. Uh, after that, they should be good to go though. Uh, as far as fermentation goes, we're gonna wanna keep this one cold. It's a traditional English ale yeast, 
and therefore needs to be fermented slightly cooler than other normal ale yeasts. So, you know, for this beer in particular, we're gonna probably start at around 60 degrees and bring it up to about 65 over the course of one to two weeks. Um, and then maybe we'll finish it out around 70 if it starts to get kind of sluggish. Uh, this yeast does have a reputation for stalling or just kind of falling asleep halfway through fermentation uh, if it's too cold. So if you do see that happening, just go ahead and raise the temperature a bit, rouse the yeast a little bit, should do the trick for you. Uh, after primary fermentation is complete and most of the visible fermentation activity is, is complete, that's when we're gonna dry hop. Uh, so we have two ounces of East Kent Goldings that we're gonna dry hop with. And uh, in my case, I have them in the actual collection jar underneath my Firmzilla, which is, makes for a very easy uh, oxygen-free dry hop. All I have to do is open a valve and uh, the hops will get sucked into the beer. If you don't have that capability, don't fear. Number one, you could just open the fermenter, drop the dry hops in and close it back up. You probably will be fine. Um, you might have a little oxygen ingress. This isn't like a New England IPA where it's just gonna spoil uh, when you get like three oxygen molecules in there. It's gonna be fine if you open it up. On the other hand, if you don't really wanna run that much risk, you can always take a uh, small hop bag, fill it with your dry hopping addition, put a magnet or a steel object inside of it and put a magnet on the outside of the fermenter. So that way it just kind of clings itself to the edge of the fermenter uh, up above the wort. And when it's time to dry hop, just pull that external magnet off and it'll drop right into the beer and you should be good to go. You can just recover it afterwards. Um, so that's another option if you don't have a separate thing like the uh, Firmzilla does. Overall though, as long as you pitch enough yeast and you keep it at a somewhat cooler temperature, you really shouldn't have any issues during fermentation on this one. It shouldn't be too picky. Um, once again, if it stalls or falls asleep, just give it a good shake, raise the temperature a little bit, and you know, kind of repeat that process if it doesn't quite take off after the first time. Uh, failing that, you can always get some yeast uh, vitalizer, which you can purchase at most homebrew shops as well, and that should help wake them up as well. Uh, you're gonna aim for a final gravity on this beer somewhere between like 10.15 to 10.18. So if you do end up in that region, uh, you may actually be finished fermentation. I'd say let it sit for maybe a maximum of about two weeks before kegging. Um, you don't need to worry too much about letting this one sit for a long time. So this beer decided that it would uh, get a little cheeky and uh, finish a lot lower than we anticipated. So it looks like it finished at about 10.10 instead of 10.15. Uh, so yeah, a lot lower than expected. I'm not totally sure why that happened the way it did, uh, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and package it up and let it condition for a bit longer and see what happens. All right, everybody, so fermentation went pretty much exactly as planned. Uh, so we kept the temperature pretty low, ramped it up towards the end. I uh, did about a two week fermentation and then I put some dry hops in there uh, and I did that for about five days. And then we drew it off the dry hops, put it into the keg and then force carbonated it over the next couple days, aged it for about a week and a half. Now it's about ready. Now you can sort of emulate the conditions of a cask ale or a real ale um, in a corny keg if you just prime it with sugar uh, as if it's like one big giant bottle and then let's set it on its side, let's sit for about two weeks or so uh, as it primes, carbonates, and then creates that kind of cask environment. You can do that. Um, I chose not to because I'm kind of in a rush to fill my kegs back up because I kind of ran out of beer. Um, and also because uh, I just don't really have the space to lay a keg on its side right now. It just doesn't make sense for me. It's definitely not real ale. This beer really should be served out of a cask. I understand that. I'm not trying to piss too many people off here, but I just didn't do that. However, it is pretty good. It's a very interesting showcase of Foggles, and uh, I think it's definitely worth diving into in some detail. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so I named this beer The Fuggle Is Real, and it comes in at 6.1% ABV and 61 IBUs. All right, so for appearance of the beer, it's a bit darker than I would have liked. Uh, it's kind of a darker copper color, kind of got some red tones in there, but also a lot of brown. It's probably a little too dark for the style, if I'm being completely honest. This is, of course, supposed to be a pale ale, uh, which doesn't quite look that way. It could be a result of adding a little too much black malt. It really doesn't take much to change that color. 
Um, it also could be a result of the Crystal 120 I put in there. Uh, also, ends up being a bit hazy um, because of the dry hop, and uh, that's really not going to go away, I don't think. Um, but if it does, it's going to result in a slightly brighter beer. So the haze does kind of contribute to how dark it actually does look. Uh, pours with a nice kind of cream-colored head uh, that has uh, a solid head retention sticking around for a long time, which is pretty nice. Now we'll go in for the aroma. So it has a very pungent aroma. Uh, these hops are very earthy. Uh, the British hops, the Fuggles, are, are just extremely like mossy, uh, <laughs> which is pretty cool. UK hops are generally very different from American hops. Um, there's a lot less kind of pine and citrus and grapefruit. You get more of an earthy and uh, herbal kind of character. And yeah, primarily the, the nose is dominated by the Fuggles. All right, so then we'll go in for mouthfeel slash texture. That's a pretty standard medium kind of body um, with a smooth mouthfeel. Not too heavily carbonated, which is good. You don't really want to over carbonate this style. You want to kind of lean towards a lighter carbonation on this style because that way it uh, expresses more of its, its characteristics and flavors. Uh, you don't get as much aroma out of it, but you get a lot more um, kind of roundness in the flavor. Um, but it also kind of aids in the mouthfeel and that it's not too aggressive. It's got like a kind of nice medium robustness to it. Uh, nothing too heavy. It's not like a porter or a stout, but it also kind of has the uh, effect of fooling you into thinking that it finishes dryly because uh, of that high sulfate content. So now we're going to go in for flavor. So make no mistake, this is an IPA. It is a bitter beer. Um, <laughs> the, the bittering charge that I threw in of Target might have been a bit much. The bittering charge of Target, um, it's kind of a classic way of doing a, an English IPA in the modern way. Target's not that old of a hop, but um, it comes across very sharp and bitter um, because Target has a very strong percentage of cohumulone, which is a hop oil that kind of creates that very strong, sharp uh, slaps you in the face kind of hop bite. Now initially in the first several weeks of serving this beer that, that character is going to be pretty aggressive but that will fade over the next several weeks and that's going to start kind of blending this flavor into something a little bit more mellow and a little bit uh, less aggressive at the beginning but um, as it is an IPA I kind of want to mention all of the effects of all of the hops that I use. It's important to think about what your bittering addition is going to do. That cohumulone bite at the very beginning is expected and that's something that's actually part of this beer. Remember, we're not trying to make a, you know, an old world pale ale out of this thing. We're trying to make something that's more akin to what would be drinkable in the modern world. Uh, this has that same kind of West Coast IPA bite to it that you get in some of those old school 2000s IPAs, um, just with an English take on it. And then the rest of this beer is all about Fuggles. And Fuggles are a totally different hop. You're going to look at it more of a, an aroma and flavor character with these guys. Both the late boil and the dry hopping additions really made for a pretty interesting Fuggles character in this beer. And it's a totally different hop uh, than most of your typical American IPA type of uh, hop varietals. We're so used to grapefruit and citrus and pine and tropical fruits and, you know, all that stuff. So the predominant flavor I would get out of this is just earthiness and dankness. The, the oil that is the most uh, prevalent in Fuggles is Myrcene, um, which is responsible largely for that kind of uh, skunky weed-like character, uh, <laughs> as well as just like a, a nice earthiness and herbalness. Um, it's totally different than any other American variety. Largely a dank, mossy, earthy character uh, with a lot of really interesting, complex other uh, flavors in there. Um, I'm getting like a a pretty significant lemony citrus character. Um, it's like a, it's like a very bitter citrus, but also has a very strong herbal content to it as well. Um, kind of like a thyme, I guess, spice type kind of character. Um, just it's totally different, uh, and it's really fun to kind of play with some of these European hops. You'll be brewing like a standard European ale, and you know, not something that's super hop forward. You throw them in your beer, you try and find out what those flavors are, and you can't really pick them out until you do something like this and then you realize that the flavors have been there all along and it's just part of that kind of character of beer the only problem with the earthy hops is that this is like right on the edge of being a grass bomb um so 
The uh, European hops being low alpha means you need to add a lot of them, and also the character of them is, you know, distinctly earthy, like I keep saying, um, which can result in a slightly vegetal tasting beer. This one's not there yet, but it's it's close, like another half an ounce of hops in, in the dry hop, and I probably would have gotten a grassy flavor out of it. Now, as this is an English beer, there's definitely more to talk about than just the hops. Uh, the malt character of this is also just as important, which is a little bit obliterated by the hops. Um, <laughs> I'm getting mostly a breadiness from the Maris Otter and then a little bit of a toffee flavor from the Crystal Malts, but it, there's not that much detectable malt character because the hops are very strong. Um, which, well, you could say that's kind of the point of the beer. But as you can tell, the selection of using the ESB yeast and uh, the complicated malt build didn't really pay off. I was kind of hoping that would add a little bit of roundness, but it kind of didn't. Um, and there's some added malt complexity I would like to see in this. One of the very first all grain beers I made was an English IPA, and it had more of that kind of malty character. I kind of want to go back to that recipe and see what the differences were, um, because that one I distinctly remember being more of the classic kind of biscuity character of English ales uh, with a really pleasant hop uh, character as well. This one's a bit more hoppy than I probably should have had it because um, it is, like I said, obliterating the malt character. Uh, as far as improvements to this beer, uh, let's just start all the way back at the at the bittering edition. Um, I'd say instead of Target, we might want to use something like Challenger, which doesn't have as much cohumulone in it. That's going to kind of help uh, keep this sharp bite out of the beer, um, which might be beneficial if you're trying to drink this beer faster um, and not have it sit and age out and mellow out as long as it needs to with the with the target in it. The second thing I would improve is adding um, some additional malt complexities. I'd say the other thing we want to probably remove is the Crystal 40, the medium crystal, um, and add in something like a Brees special roast uh, or a, a little bit of biscuit malt as well, maybe both of those things, to add some additional complexity and roundness and biscuitiness to this beer. It is kind of important for it, and it needs it to back up the hops. Otherwise, it just ends up becoming dominated by the hops, just like it is here. Lastly, um, even though I had maybe like 30 grains worth of um, black malt, I would probably just even cut that in half pick out like 10 or 15 kernels and throw them in. That way you might end up with a little bit less dark of a color. Uh, and otherwise, if you can find them, you always use the British crystal malts. Don't use the generic American ones. Unless like in my case, you have only that option. Other than that, this beer is a really fun showcase of Fuggles, uh, which is a really interesting and, and unique hop. Um, you can also use East Kent Goldings in the same capacity and they have a totally different character. East Kent Goldings largely are gonna be a bit more floral versus the strong earthiness of the Fuggles. Uh, which is probably going to be a little bit more approachable for some people, um, but that's just something to keep in mind. Either one of them works great in an English IPA. It's a fun style to explore, and it's very different from the other IPAs that are out there, so it's definitely worth checking out uh, if you're curious in that sort of thing. If you're interested in making the beer, once again, the recipe is down below in the description, which should work for any sort of all-in-one system like the claw hammer system, Robo Brew, Grain Father, that sort of stuff should be pretty similar. All right, so I hope you found this video useful and enjoyed it. And if you did, please go hit that like button right now. It makes a big difference for me. And if you want to see this stuff on a regular basis, hit that subscribe button. I will typically upload a new grain of glass video roughly every two to three weeks. But if you don't want to wait around that long, uh, here is my other social media. I have an Instagram down here and my Patreon. I'm going to link up in the corner where there's a lot of additional video content for your enjoyment. If you want to discuss any aspects of the brew or the history of IPA or English beer, uh, anything in general, let me know in the comment section down below. How do you make your English IPAs? I read every single comment and I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can. If you want to help support the channel, there's a bunch of links down in the description down below uh, with all of my brewing equipment, including the claw hammer system, which if you're still looking for an all-in-one system that can hold a lot of grain, I do highly recommend the claw hammer system. So go check that stuff out. Anyway, I hope you guys really enjoyed the video and learned something, got something useful out of it. Anyway, I'll catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers. Yeah.